Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And uh, this is another one of our deep dive series on uh, the approach to pulmonary vascular lesions. And we have a very interesting case for you today. This is from a 66-year-old female who presents with a history of uh, scleroderma. And she has uh, shortness of breath and she has imaging studies that show increasing bilateral infiltrates over time. And a wedge biopsy is performed. So immediately, scleroderma, right? Connective tissue disease. You worry about IPATH, connective tissue disease associated ILD and that type of thing. And so when I take a peek at this biopsy and quickly start zoning in on some particular areas, I don't know about you, Kevin, but I'm seeing sort of a, a at least in this field, a fairly impressive expansion of the interstitium. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, if, we, if the whole lung looked like this, I suppose you'd even be considering kind of a, a bloody hemosiderin laden version of NSIP. NSIP, exactly. Exactly. And, and it's kind of cellular, right? So you might go to the, you might go to the, the six patterns poster and you might think that this is a cellular infiltrates pattern. You, pattern might, three, yeah. you might go down, the, down that road on this. But there's a few clues here, even, um, even at this high power, without looking at any of the other portions of the lung, there's a few clues here that this is not your typical NSIP pattern with inflammatory cells that are expanding the interstitium. There's actually something else that's expanding the interstitium here. Yeah, looks like the capillary network is is reduplicated or triduplicated. Exactly. <laughs> that so word. It's <laughs> triduplicated. <laughs> yeah, I mean there there's an impressive amount of red blood cells, and when you look closely, you can see that their capillary network is all over the place in these expanded interstitiums. So this interstitial expansion is not per se due to fibrosis. It's not per se due to increased inflammatory cells, although we do have a few here and there. But this interstitial expansion is really related to a proliferation of the capillary network. Right. Increased numbers of epithelial cells and pericytes and all those, all those vessel-associated uh, cells. And if we go to maybe another portion of the biopsy and we look at the interstitium in another portion of the biopsy, much less impressive. Right. You could argue it's still not completely normal, but it, it's highly variable in the intensity, isn't it? It's it's patchy in the way it's distributed throughout the parenchyma. It's patchy in its intensity. I think if you look at this low power field and you look at the, the section on the left, you can see that there's uh, much more interstitial expansion there on the left than there is on the right. And this yeah. would this would of course translate into the CT scan where you'd have areas of more increased opacity and areas of the of more normal appearing uh, opacity. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, we've got this expansion of the interstitium by a capillary network that's kind of patchy throughout the biopsy. There's a few yes. other uh, findings here. We do have an extensive number of hemocytin laden macrophages. Vascular congestion, you can see a beautiful red blood cell tracking along the alveolar walls, in the alveolar walls, right exactly. there. Very nice. So, I don't know what you're thinking, Kevin, at this point, but I'm starting to think that we have some sort of vascular problem here because we've got a tremendous amount of hemocytin laden macrophages and we've got this proliferation of capillaries within the interstitium, which we term what? Well, the term that we, comes to mind would be capillary hemangiomatosis. Exactly. Pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, PCH. And I think when you see PCH, I think the first task of the surgical pathologist is to be sure that it's not NSIP and it is PCH. And we talked about what to look for, the increased capillary profiles. You can even get a CD34 uh, stain sometimes if you're unsure and kind of get a sense for how many uh, CD34 positive capillary profiles there are in the interstitium. You could also get a CD45 to convince yourself that the amount of inflammatory cells is relatively limited compared to the uh, proliferation of this capillary network. 
Now, Max, in a patient who is acutely ill with this picture under the microscope right here, you might even have a little concern about an alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, you know, if you saw fibrin in here, you That's saw true. some organization. So you just, you just um, you know, hit on the key distinction in that point, right? This could absolutely be the image of a patient with microscopic polyangitis and diffuse yeah. alveolar hemorrhage. But we don't have acute lung injury, and the patient is not presenting acutely ill. Right. And, and because of those two things, that is much, much, much lower on my differential diagnosis here. So you see how the history and the radiology sometimes is helpful to you in staying out of trouble. I think really that's the point we'd like to emphasize over and over again. If you just look at the pathology, there is a chance you're going to get taken down the wrong path. And it, it, once you go down that path, it's very hard to extricate yourself on a case and reform an idea. So, so, Max, you know, some of those areas at high magnification remind me of the patient who's got um, severe congestive heart failure, and they get heart failure lung with hemosiderin and interstitial thickening. You know, that kind of gives me this idea of venous outflow obstruction. Exactly. You know, this concept we use. So if this could be venous outflow obstruction from a big vein, like all the way to the heart. The big right? vein we've got. Yeah. What if you did this to a vein that was closer to the capillary net on the far side? Uh-huh. Blocked outflow from the capillary net of a lobule, for example. Now you'd have back pressure into the interstitium, into the capillary net. Maybe that's what we're looking at here. And I think that's the way to, to, to think about this process. Pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, once you distinguish it from, from uh, NSIP or an NSIP pattern, I think you do want to do exactly what Kevin's doing right now. Start working your way down a vascular avenue. So why is this pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis occurring? Like we said in, in our, our uh, previous video about uh, pulmonary uh, veno-occlusive disease, uh, many people think pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis is part of that spectrum, right? And so you can have heart failure that gives you these changes, right? And you can have pulmonary veins, small pulmonary veins that are occluded that give you these changes. And it's a spectrum. And what happens, Kevin, if your vein is abnormal? and it backs up into your capillaries and you have capillary hemangiomatosis or proliferation, what's going to happen to those pressures then? Arterial side secondary pulmonary hypertension, arterial hypertension. So that, that pressure model, I think, is an important one. That even if we can't prove all of these relationships, we do know a lot about the vascular supply of the lung and the hemodynamics of the lung. So I think we shouldn't throw those out just because we might have found a genetic abnormality to explain some patients with veno-occlusive disease. I don't think we should try to make capillary hemangiomatosis into its own isolated entity. I agree completely. So if we start looking, this is an interlobular septum. And first off, the pleura is thickened, the interlobular septae are thickened. Wow. Like substantially thickened, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what would you want to do in this case, Kevin? You've looked at the H and E. You're concerned about a lot of these vascular structures. You're still uncertain if you're dealing with pulmonary veins or pulmonary arteries. Well, I I'll tell you, I took I would take one look at this case at 10x, and I would say I'd call the histo lab and I'd say I need an uh, elastic von Gies. I need an EVG stain stat, meaning look how fast that can. And not stat, but I mean, but you know what I mean. this game. Yeah. The, the reason is don't sit on the case for two or three days studying it and then decide to order an EVG. Once you think you've got a vascular case, a funky looking vessel like these, you have to get the EVG as we've seen here. And it is like turning a light bulb on, folks. Um, I know people always say, get your special stains. But this is one where you do the special stain and it's like you feel like a hero because you have just nailed down the process. So what did you learn from your elastic tissue stain, Max? Now, now some cases, of course, 
uh, are going to be much more subtle in this case. We're kind of showing you a pretty obvious case here, right? right. We have pulmonary veins that are absolutely occluded. Single layer, single elastic layer, absolutely occluded. This is the diagnostic feature of pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. Again, something, uh, this is a, a case that uh, you may want to put into a textbook because of the, the occlusive lesions are so impressive here. Yeah. yeah, it's a great placeholder. It's a great, um, you know, pathognomonic, if you will, uh, example of the changes of veno-occlusive disease. If I'm ever, th ever thinking somebody's got capillary hemangiomatosis, I go immediately on the EVG and I start at the pleura and I work my way into the lung and I, I look for, I don't know, 30 or 40 veins. I count them because not every vein is going to be completely sclerotic like this, but find like out of 50, find five or six, you have your diagnosis. Perfect. And, and that's, of course, patients with scleroderma, their increased risk for not only connective okay. tissue disease associated ILD, but certainly for vascular abnormalities, right? Um, if they can have uh, vascular crises and end up, you know, blowing out their kidneys with vascular lesions. And so this is this is certainly within the disease spectrum of a, of a patient with scleroderma. Yeah, beautiful case, beautiful case. Let's look at the artery side now. So we played, we, we, we were drawn to the capillary hemangiomatosis. We had a hypothesis so we confirmed it with sclerotic veins. Now let's go to the arterial side and let's find some airways with their adjacent arteries and figure out there should always be some degree of hypertensive change in these arteries. Right, because, if you're that, because they're reacting to that increased pressure, right? So this right. is a pulmonary it's artery. the capillary head and the pressure pulse wave. Now the pressure is built up in front of the capillary net. And we should see changes. Look at that. Beautiful. They're, they're pretty well, obvious, right? Really right? This a dual layer of, a, of a elastic tissue here, confirming it's a pulmonary artery. And normally your intima should sit pretty close to on top of your elastic layer here. So we should have a nice wide open lumen here of this pulmonary artery. And instead, we have this robust proliferation within the intima. That's a reactive intimal sclerosis or pro proliferation. Uh, there within the pulmonary arteries. See if we can find amazing it. form or concentric. It looks eccentric to me. It does. Uh, a lot of these like, and that always makes me think about post thrombotic pulmonary hypertension. And I don't mean thrombosis like thromboembolism. I'm talking about thrombosis like intimal damage from pressure causing a rent or a tear in the intima and reparative change leading to a, a thrombosis in situ. And when those heal, they heal as eccentric uh, areas in the cross-sectional lumen. So, you know, one of the things about secondary pulmonary hypertension like this and primary with plexiform lesions, and we've talked about this in another video, is the elastic lamina in the primary forms seems to get damaged in the process. So you kind of lose the internal elastic lamina within the scar. Whereas here you can see both lamina are preserved and it's all the subintimal area that's become thickened. And it can be patchy, right? Not every pulmonary artery is the same. So I was focusing in on this one to, to show that this one actually has what you might appreciate as a normal appearing intima, right? The intima is just delicately sitting on top of that, uh, that uh, internal elastic layer. Right. So you, you've got to check a bunch of arteries, uh, check a bunch of veins, and uh, then you've got it. It's what's, by the way, Max, what is that little starfish? Yeah, I was going to go over to the starfish because otherwise somebody would leave a comment and say, hey, you didn't talk what about the starfish over there on the, on, on the edge of the case. So, so what is the starfish? Like a healed scar of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, a smoking exactly. related interstitial lung disease. Exactly. Uh, patients yeah. also Old fibrotic PLCH. Perhaps the patient was a past smoker, certainly uh, a, a, in fact, if I saw this lesion, I don't know what you would do, Kevin, in your report, but I'd probably say healed lesion of fibrotic pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. I, yeah, I don't really have a differential diagnosis for this. Right. I but agree. Yeah. Along with those dilated spaces, those 
So there's a paraceptal type emphysema on the scar there. It's not really paraceptal, but it's next to the fibrous tissue. Exactly. Cool case, Max. Thanks a lot for sharing it. Yep. Thank you. Don't forget to like and comment below. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Signing off.